Lunchtime Heroes is brought to you in part by Shift Creative, Start Shifting, and Volcano Produce, Erupting with Freshness. Hey, everybody. Welcome. We're super glad you're here today hanging out with us. I truly hope you're having a good day. I start my show off saying that every time. Having a good day, starting off having a good day, spreading some love in this world is how we're going to make the most changes ever possible on this planet. We've got to come together, get under with everybody, give a big group hug and just start our day off with such positivity. It's so important and we got to do more of it. Believe me, we're going to be positive and talking about that today. I've got a couple of guests that are joining me today with an organization I'm very, very excited to talk about. You all know my opinion about our lunchtime heroes out there and how incredibly important childhood nutrition is to our future of this country and the future of our planet. I think it's the fastest way we solve a whole lot of problems, including healthcare, climate, and all kinds of other woes that we have in this country. And I'm going to continue talking about it until somebody takes the last breath out of me. And who knows at that point, I might keep talking. You never know. But nonetheless, I'm very, very thrilled to have with me today. I don't want to say interim because I just seems whatever, but the interim co-executive directors of the National Farm to School Network and true lunchtime heroes, please welcome Miguel and Jessica to the broadcast today. I am honored and thrilled that you are hanging out with me today, and I cannot wait to have this conversation. Good. Thank you. We're glad to be here, too. That's yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for saying that now. Do me a favor. When we get done, say it then. That's what matters, really. Just say it at the end, right? Just say, like, I had a great time. That's what matters. No, tease it. I'm super stoked you're here. You know, <laughs> school, school nutrition is just such a big topic for me. And feeding these kiddos is such an important issue in this country. And I don't think that, how do I want to say it in a nice way? I think we get it, but I don't think we get it. I think it's like, you're right. It's important. But what did you do about it today? Right. And as we discussed earlier, you know, parents are recognizing their voice matters and their voice matters all throughout their child's life. And if you're worried about, you know, or, or concerned about or getting involved in what your kids are being taught or what your kids are doing in the school, don't forget, you should be just as concerned about what your kids are eating at school because it's what's going to make what they're learning that much more impactful and that much um, more meaningful in change. So with that being said, without any further ado, I'm going to shut the hell up because I can talk about this. And we're going to talk about this forever. But I'd love for you guys, if you wouldn't mind, just to introduce yourself a little bit and say, hey, Jessica, I'll open up with you. If you wouldn't mind, just give everybody a brief little bio. Miguel, get ready. You're going second if you didn't figure it out on this one. <laughs> Thanks, Todd. Hello, everyone. I'm Jessica Goodmanson. I, as Todd would introduce me, the interim co-executive director, along with Miguel, uh, I was born and raised in Southern California, so food was all around me as a kid. Um, you know, there's incredible access to food in Southern California, and at the same time, there's not exactly incredible access for everybody to food. So I grew up in a home that didn't always have food to eat, and that is really what drives me in this work. It's, um, you know, when you talk about kids being hungry, I was a kid in school that was hungry, and I know what it, that's like. Um, so, you know, growing up, we used to engage, my, my dad would go work on an avocado farm for fun um, and just be around and be engaged in land in the soil. And I personally, to this day, love being in the land outside, getting my hands dirty and uh, growing food. Even though I'm not very good at it, it's something that drives me and brings me a lot of enjoyment. Um, I grew up went to college and, uh, you know, did a few things after college, worked for a Fortune 500 company for a few years, worked for a small business, um, but really found my passion for nonprofit work uh, around 2005. Um, and that's when I got into working for the Urban Environments to... Oh. Urban and Environmental Institute at Occidental College. It is a mouthful. Say that five times fast. <laughs> it's almost impossible. Um, and working at UEPI, uh, was where I started working with the National Farm to School Network for the first time. And it really brought together my passion for wanting to do something that contributed to uh, a better life for everybody. You know, not just feeding kids, but doing something about why kids are hungry in the first place. Wanting to make sure yeah. that we're not just working to make sure people have food, um, but that we're changing the conditions that made it so there wasn't access to food to begin with. So that's that's really who I am. And why I'm excited to be here today. I love it. Well, you can, I mean, it's I, I, not to not to jump into the top of Miguel before he gets rolling, but to hear you start your story and then get to the part of where you are now, the level of passion, the whole level of conversation, you could just hear the tone of your voice completely change to like, okay, 
this girl is on the path she's supposed to be on and whatever door is in front of her is not going to be closed for very long. And I loved it. Thank you for sharing that. Miguel, don't screw up. The pressure's on you. You got to top that. Go. <laughs> yeah, no, there's, I, I, if I had screwed up, I would have screwed up by now. So, uh, so, so Todd, you know, you know how we are, we are in different uh, positions and occupations. We, you know, we're talking about this beforehand. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, one of the things that I've recognized uh, and even now saying saying it is that uh, farm to table or farm to community is truly has been in my DNA. And I, you know, I didn't truly recognize that. Uh, you know, I'm a multi-generational farm field worker. My family, uh, when I was born into my family, that's what they were doing. They were, they were tra traveling around the country uh, working in the fields, following the fields. seasonal crops. So we were from Texas, but we traveled to Idaho, which is where actually where I was born, uh, and um, you know to California, Minnesota, North Dakota. So that that was what I knew for the first seventeen years of my life is working in the fields, and uh, as you know, being working in produce, how how difficult a job that that truly is. But that's really where I. Um, I, I, I gain my passion, if you will, uh, mm -hmm. not so much about the, uh, the, the work, but about the food. Uh, it, nutrition has always been um, important to me from a very young age. Um, uh, I mean, I'm talking like from five years of age, I knew that food, the food we eat is important to our bodies. I didn't know it was called nutrition. I just knew that eating healthy foods was important. At the age sure. of 13, I also knew that I need, I wanted to study nutrition. I wanted to learn more about it uh, because I knew what it, what it was doing uh, to my own body in terms of the, the, the foods that I was eating and consuming and so forth. Um, and like Jessica was saying, I mean, I didn't recognize it when I was a young boy um, that there was food insecurity, that my, my parents were buying calories uh, and not necessarily focusing on the, the types of foods that we really should be eating. Um, I, you know, I, I was, but I remember, um, uh, I was concentrating on that, but, but I, my mom and dad were doing the best they could in buying the, the best foods that they could. So we ate, you know, um, fairly healthy, but there was also a lot of highly processed foods. I remember growing up, uh, because that's what, that's what they could afford. Um, yeah. but, um, I, I did eventually, um, go on to college and I, I, as I said, I wanted to uh, learn more about nutrition, so I earned a degree in nutrition. Uh, I knew that I, what I didn't want to do, Todd, I didn't want to work in a hospital. I wanted, I, I worked in a hospital when I was in college, and I, I knew that wasn't the place for me. I wanted to keep patients out of the hospital. I didn't know what that job was going to be, but the universe led me to school food services. And so yeah. I spent four decades in school food services, uh, just you know, uh, talking about and, and, and teaching about what I had learned about foods and making sure that children were being exposed to the best possible foods, all children for that matter, being sure. exposed 100%. to the best, that their families understood why we were doing the work that we were doing in schools. Um, and today, you know, you, you've introduced me as the interim co-executive director. I've been, um, I've known about the National Farm to School Network since the early 2000s, uh, where since for, you know, when I moved out to California, so I learned about them. Uh, but um, uh, I've known uh, of them and I've certainly have been served under, on their board as well uh, mm -hmm. when I was food service director. Uh, I've been uh, in this position since August. And I just want to tell you that I've, um, there have been thoroughly enjoyed the work that we're doing because of the impact that the National Farm to School Network, we're gonna talk a little bit about, about that. But more importantly mm -hmm. uh, for me, it's the fact that I'm able to team up with someone like Jessica that's been in this industry for as long as she has uh, in, this, in this space, uh, helping schools out. I mean, schools, as you, as you know, need, need a lot of help and a lot of resources. And the National Farm to School Network is one of those organizations that's been, from, from, the, from the early days, has been engaged in mm -hmm. connecting people, connecting resources, uh, educating, and providing uh, the necessary tools so we can continue to deliver these messages about healthy foods and so forth. I love it. Well, as I said, it's amazing to hear 
how your path has led you to this, right? And how and I talk about all the time, you know, we go on a path in our life and, you know, we have choices we can go left, you can go right, go up, go down, go backwards, right? Yeah. Or, you know, and you don't know, and you keep going down that path, these doors open these opportunities. And for the two of you to be sitting here and share where you started, why you're here and hear that passion of both of you, this is going to be a really fun conversation. Before <laughs> I dive into some questions, I want to frame up a few things for everybody. I think it's important that they grasp a little bit of this as we start to talk. 62% of the teachers in this country say that their kids are coming to school hungry in their classrooms. 62% of the teachers say that. Yeah. That's a big number, right? Yeah. One in eight kids in this country is, is hungry. And we were both talking, we were all talking uh, earlier. We all think that number is probably not accurate. We probably, it's probably one in seven, one in six and a half, one in whatever it is. I don't think it's one in eight anymore personally, but we'll see. Over 10% of our nation, 38, 30, almost 34 million folks live in households that struggle against food insecurity or lacking access to a nutritious diet. Miguel, you talked about it, buying calories. So my first question to open up, Jessica, you want to take the first one? Doesn't matter. You guys can, you guys can arm wrestle for it. I don't care. I'll watch. But nonetheless, <laughs> I'll throw it out there. Tell me, and the question for both of you, what does food insecurity mean to each of you? Yeah, absolutely. You know, food insecurity quite simply means you don't have access to food. Um, but, you know, just even in that simple de definition, there's just such a huge impact that has on people's lives. And I feel like I really experienced that as a kid. Um, yeah. You know, when you don't have access to food, you're just, you sleep through a lot of classes because you don't have enough energy to be present and learn. When you don't have access to food, you're doing things like, um, I had a job and I would go to work before and after school so that I would be able to eat with my friends. And um, that meant I missed out on a lot of things that other people were doing. Um, wow. You know, not having food readily available to you, you really, um, you're working really hard just to get to where everybody else is, where everybody else is starting from. You know, folks, um, you know, the way it should be, many folks probably have access, they have a breakfast, they have lunch, either from their parents or they eat at school and they get home and there's food for them. So if, if those basic needs aren't already met, you're spending a lot of energy making sure that you can just get to that basic level before you can do anything else, um, before you can learn, before you can play sports with your friends, before you can um, do extracurricular things after school that you might you might be interested in. You're really just um, focused on uh, getting to where you need to be. And um, I think I think the thing that I was reflecting on is that can be also really isolating for kids. Um, you know, 100%. If, if if you're in a situation where all of your friends have food and you don't, you know, it, it just automatically um, puts up some barriers and separates you and makes it so you can't participate in things they might be doing, you know, um, even simple things. Like if your friends are going out and, and you don't have the money to go out with them, they're going out to eat and you're worried about not being able to pay for dinner. You just don't go out with your friends anymore. So, right. you know, not having access to food is um, a really simple statement, but it has so many ripple effects in people's lives. Yeah, um, I couldn't agree more with what you just said. And I think that one of the big problems that I think that we have to try to understand better is the embarrassment factor that comes with asking for help. And I think we have to get over that. I think we've, we, we, we've created that. We've created that ourselves, you know, um, and I think it starts with seeing somebody at a traffic light with a sign and we instantly dart our eyes because we don't want to make eye contact. We've got to start being those people and stop recognizing that. It, we're not doing anything by turning away, right? And I, and I think that this is an issue when it comes to children's nutrition and hungry kids is one that we can't turn away from. We've spent way too much time talking about this issue as a country and not enough time and energy getting this issue off of the table. No offense, but I'd love to see you out of business, right? I would love to see everybody that's doing stuff like this, trying to make this real happen because it just, it, because we're just not winning the day as a nation. We're not winning the day for our kiddos and we're not winning the day for tomorrow. And I think it's so powerful. And your words, Jessica, your words are incredibly touching to me because you come from a place of living that and walking that walk and knowing what that feels like. And so for you to have that personal experience and share it like that, it's pretty damn powerful. It's just, it's just not something you made up. It's something you walk. So thank you for sharing that. I appreciate it. I got to go to you, Miguel, and ask the same question. Talk to me. What's food insecurity mean to you from your perspective? Yeah, thank you for asking the question. Yeah, you know, um, the, I spent the first 20 years as a school food service director uh, in Texas um, addressing, um, you know, again, making sure that all children uh, were being provided with the healthiest foods that we could possibly provide 
Uh, but knowing that not all children were had access to foods for different reasons, some some of it being, you know, we have this three tiered system where you've got you have the kids that uh, the US the USDA says that the families uh, have enough money and they can provide for food for their children in schools, and then others. Uh, the parents don't make enough money, so they qualify for either free or reduced meals. It's a tiered system, but in within that tiered system, uh, there's you know kids that um, that those families are are, are e economically disadvantaged. You know they're they're earning enough based on the uh, the the the, uh, the scale the scale correct that's set mm -hmm. up for them, but yet they they. Actually, school lunch becomes very much discretionary spending for them, and they they're not participating in in the school meal program. Uh, so, you know, we have those those things going on in schools. But I'm telling you the story about Texas because I spent 20 years really working extremely hard to make sure that the types of foods we we're providing were the healthiest foods available. Um, sure. I made a choice to move out to California uh, about 20 years ago. And um, you got to be wondering about that choice today because I live here and I wonder about it. <laughs> well, actually, it was one Sorry. of the it was one of the best choices that honestly I could have made for, for many reasons. I mean, uh, we won't have time to go into today, but but really from from, a, from my perspective as school food service director, I knew that I had do, been doing a lot of this work, and I felt like I was doing a lot of this work on my own merit. I mean, as a, I didn't have sure. the I didn't have the support system that I needed. Uh, from administrators, from parents, from students, from the community at large. This is all in Texas. But I thought California, you know, all that is probably in place. And um, I'm going to, you know, enjoy my job as the school food service director. Um, and what I found was just quite the opposite. I found what, what that the food systems in California uh, were very similar to the food systems that, that, that we had in Texas. So students were still not being provided the types of foods that we needed to provide them. There were still gaps. Uh, people still weren't paying attention to what was being served in, in schools. Um, and so that was my epiphany, uh, Todd. That was my epiphany at that moment. I said, something is wrong. I don't know what it is, but I'm going to try to figure it out. And in, in figuring it out, I learned about the food systems and I learned about values that weren't mm -hmm. being so for me, it was always important that the types of foods that we provided, I shared my story about growing up, that my parents were buying calories. Well, in schools, uh, it was the same thing. School food service programs didn't have sufficient financial resources to buy the types of foods that they needed to. So they were also, and today we still experience that, by and large, are buying calories to try to provide yeah calories to children and calories in the form of some, some highly processed foods, some fruits and vegetables. So a mixture of a, a little bit of everything. And for me, it's, it's about providing students the best possible foods that we can possibly provide because of food insecurities that, that do exist and exist. schools yeah. at homes and in communities. And, you know, you've said it before, um, Schools are the one place that we can truly make a difference, but we can't do it alone. It takes a it takes a the entire community to make it happen. Hundred percent agree, and I think and I want to be mindful, and I want to make sure we get this on the table as we open this up. There's kids that are getting breakfast, lunch, and supper at school Monday through Friday, and they're not getting fed Saturday and Sunday. They come to school Monday. I want to. I think it's super important to bring up kids come to school Monday morning hungry. They're excited to come to school because they're going to get a meal. And that is not only scary for starters, but it's also to your point, Miguel, and what we talked about, one of the greatest opportunities we have to change our country in such a positive light that, you know, that building is still there Saturday and Sundays, folks. It's not like it just rolls up into a little tiny cubicle and they brush it off. It's still standing there. It's still available to do things. And we need to be thinking much more outside the box and recognize that those buildings are there for our use and they should be there for our use and feeding our kiddos. It seems like a really good way to use a building that's not available on a Saturday and a Sunday, but what do I know? I'm not a real estate guy. I'm just guessing. So, <laughs> but it's just so important that we stay on this trajectory about trying to help these kiddos out and try to help change this country yeah. through this, through this dialogue and course. So with that being said, I got to go let's get everybody up to speed. Let's tell everybody, would you please? And I, you guys, again, we're, Pinky, you, you're going to do thumb wrestle, whatever you want. Whoever wants this question, I'll throw it at you. But tell me, what is the National Farm to School Network? Yeah. Miguel, go. Who wants it? 
I will, <laughs> Jessica's going to take that. Jessica, that Jessica, you take it, Miguel. You get the. I'll get you the next one. Yeah. Yeah, National Farm to School Network is a national nonprofit that was founded in 2007. Our mission is to increase access to local food and provide nutrition education to kids um, for the benefit of children's health, family health, community health, and farmer and producer health. Um, you know, we have a vision of a strong and just food system, and we really see that transformation through Farm to School. Um, National Farm to School Network uses several strategies to improve our the food that kids are eating as well as our food system and how it works. Um, one of those is we are a strong network of partners and we have partners in all 50 states and in territories and in DC. And um, you know, our partners are the true leaders in our network. We really um, come together and celebrate the work that each other's doing. We learn from each other. Our, our successes, our failures, which are even the best lessons and um, really support each other in, in just improving the way we're feeding our kids at schools all across the nation. Um, National Farm to School Network, it, Farm to School in general is three things. It is serving kids local foods and cafeterias. It is providing that education piece and then it's experiencing gardening. So that experiential uh, gardening component um, really serves to reinforce both the food that's being served and what kids are learning about it. And when all those three things come together, you know, it's, it's, you really just see that light bulb turn on in children's faces. Like they light up immediately when a kid sees a seed that they've planted sprout, and then they get to then taste that it's, it's pure magic, honestly. Um, so National Farm to School Network was founded in 2007. Farm to School was sort of yeah. spontaneously happening all over the nation. People, it's a fancy name to just mean like we grow food. We should eat the food that we grow. You know, why are we eating food from, you know, across 3000 miles away when right here in our backyard, we have food. So um, eating that food um, and people were starting to do this, you know, like uh, there were people in Florida working to get their farmers in Florida, working to get their products into schools. There were parents in Santa Monica who were wondering why the food that their kids were eating was terrible, um, just, just sort of spontaneously happening. And so the, the network came together um, with a handful of people engaged. And, and, you know, 15 years later, fast forward, we have 67,000 schools participating in farm to school programs. Um, that's roughly 65% of uh, US schools um, impacting 42 million students nationwide. Yeah, that's a big number. <laughs> that's a huge that's number. A big number. That's a, yeah, but you know what? But it's not 100 percent yet. No, we got not. goals, kids. We got goals, kids. We got goals. We do. No, thank we you do. For, sh for sharing it. And I and I think it's really important that people recognize that it's not the approach that you're taking. This multi tiered approach. What I'm going to get into a little bit more with you here in a second is really, I think, incredibly impactful. Because to your point, kids getting involved in their food at school is proving to be an amazing experience. Everybody that's been on the Lunchtime Heroes broadcast is also the same thing. I think about my one of my heroes out there in the world today, Stephen Ritz, and what he's done in his classroom with, with yeah. providing food to the kids and getting them involved and understanding yeah. it. It is a very powerful, powerful thing. And I don't think we recognize, it's, it's almost superpower. It's, it's, it's Marvel material. And I don't think we realize how powerful it is. And folks like yourselves that are turning over that rock and showing, hey guys, look what's happening when these kids get involved. Yeah. This is why I think we have such a great opportunity in our schools to make these these impactful changes. So I love it. I mean, I just think what you guys are doing is super, super cool. Miguel, I'm going to throw this one to you if I can. So tell me a little bit, why does connecting kids to food matter, you think, more today than ever before? Oh, yeah. I mean, you, you brought up a couple of things and which are so important uh, for those of us that have been in, involved in this uh in this space for a long time. You mentioned Stephen Ritz. I know I know Stephen Ritz, I've uh, known him for a long time. And um, we actually have to actually connected, but um, you tested something uh, early, just a little while ago. It's talking about, you know, uh, that we kids have a, we all have a superpower, but students truly have a superpower in terms of making yeah. a difference. Um, you know, one of the things that I'd like to, uh, I've shared with, with students uh, throughout my career is that uh, the foods that they eat, the foods that they choose to eat, the foods that are available to them, um, because there's a lot of different, different as you we shared earlier, di different types of foods out there. Um, sure. they, they can either have a positive um, uh, a consequence or a negative consequence on their health, on the health of the environment. I mean, and health of the uh, uh, of animals, 
and also the planet, right? So all that into consideration. So when students, you know, they're they're smart. Uh, they're extremely smart and intelligent and, and know, but we've got to provide that education and provide those resources to them so they understand what we're talking about. And when they, when they get it, when they truly understand it, when it by being engaged. Uh, so you asked me in terms of you know what, um, how do we, why it's important? It's important yeah, because why does it matter? We, we, you've got to get them in, engaged, just like Stephen is. We were we were also engaging engaging the students not only uh, in the foods that we were serving in the cafeteria, but we were engaging them by, by truly bringing kids out to the farm, uh, getting them yeah. to meet. Farmer, we wanted to. We wanted them to know where their food was being grown, who was growing their food, and then once it arrived in, in the cafeteria, how we were taking that food and then um, being able to uh, prepare, uh, uh, make a recipe with it. So culinary education classes during the school day, just like Stevens is doing, we we did it as well. Those types of education courses enabled and not only to help students. And we're going to talk a little bit about this uh, here in a little bit, but that not only helped the students, but it, helped, it helps the families, it helps the community at large, it helps farmers. I mean, everybody benefits. And of course, we, we're creating a, a healthier environment in that community that benefits everybody, truly benefits yeah, it, everybody. So it, it's, it's amazing to me, the stories about how kids are being educated about food in school and they go home and they change the diet of their family. Mm -hmm. that they're saying, hey, can we do this? Can we have this? I tried Brussels sprouts and I like them. And that's not something that most parents are expecting to hear, right? But if you do it right and invest in it, it's not a, it's not a big lift, right? It's just better understanding wow. what's out there in the world and how to make it work. And, and get, again, get those kids involved. You know, I want to come back to something that Jessica, you said, and it just popped into my head. You know, one of the conversations I've had with the recent weather we've had, you know, here on the West Coast, supplies have been this and that. They've been a hard time. One of the school educators was telling me, said, I can get every single process item available to man without any kind of supply interruption whatsoever, but I can't get fresh fruits and vegetables right now. Yeah. That's a trip. That's a trip to digest, right? And I get the weather and I'm Mother Nature and all that. Don't get me wrong. But that's a weird thing to be thinking about, that we can get the crap, but we can't get the good stuff. That seems like we should flip flop that a little bit. So yeah. I want to get into this. There's, 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 yeah, well, there's three ways that you guys and, 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 and Jessica, you talked about the three ways you guys are creating change. One of those procurement, school gardens and then education. And can you guys just if you wouldn't mind, I, whoever wants what I don't care. But let's get a little bit deeper about each one of those individually and just talk about what that means and how it fits into the National Farm School Network. Yeah. Go, Miguel, you're first. I picked on you this time. All right. Talk great, to me about, procure, talk about procurement. Yeah. So, you know, the one, the one thing that um, you, you, you test on something that's certainly uh, key, and that is uh, the procurement piece, which is one of the areas that the National Farm to School Network is able to help in because of a connection of, of uh, our network, connecting pr producers, if you will, farmers with schools, and then looking at best practices and how are they, how are they getting the food from the farm to the schools? I'll tell you, there, I was working as a school food service director, and I'll tell you this little story. Um, during the pandemic, uh, and we were we were buying from locally foods from locally source, sourcing food from locally farms. And so um, because we had those connections already set up, that didn't break down. We actually we benefited from the fact that we had those connections with uh, with our local farmers versus, you know, you heard about the, the food supply chain, uh, having problems, not being able to get food from, because of processing plants closing or, uh, not having drivers or, you know, just a, a, a slew of problems that happened during the pandemic. But the, when you connect again, when you're connecting to a, a farmer that's 20 miles away, and you've got you've got a system set up where you you know that you're gonna be not only are you have you predetermined what uh, what you're gonna buy and how much of it you're gonna buy. This is for everybody that's doing farm to school. These are the, the connections that you're making with those farmers. Um, you know, uh, Todd, I want to just say that uh, before when I arrived out here to California, uh, one of the things that that I said and I was doing, uh, and I got to meet a lot of farmers, is I was personally going out and building relationships 
uh, with our local farmers, uh, uh, making them aware about what, what we were doing in the schools and, uh, and how they could provide how they could be instrumental in providing some of the food that they were going directly to their students. But it's those relationship buildings that, and that's what the National Farm to School Network is able to do is connect, help connect those relationships, demonstrate by, by showing, uh, by using examples of food service directors that have already, have already figured this out. Um, yeah. it's, it's, it's not very difficult though. Once you, once you figure it out, then you share that information out with others. Um, and, and so that's one way, that's one way that we're able to connect our farmers, uh, with the procurement piece, uh, because it, uh, as a friend of mine used to say, he said, you know, it, it's, it, it's not rocket science, honestly, it's, it's a really simple process, but you've got to work it. You've have to engage yeah. and you have to make sure that you, that you understand each other's, uh, business and figure out, you know, how, how to best provide foods and a lot of it has to do with distribution how do you get food from the farm out into the schools and uh but that's when you engage community you engage uh other school districts buying from the same farmer and uh make it a you know make it uh sure. uh, uh reasonable for in cost for everybody engaged yeah well, look, there's no doubt that logistics is the t one of the toughest, you know, is generally an uphill battle in so many ways. So I can see where that, that is such a big part. Of it. But school gardens is a big part, too. Jessica, I'm going to lean to you on this one. You know, we talked about it briefly a little bit before, but I'd love a little more depth about what you all are doing and, and just maybe some examples of what it is. Because to your point, you know, I, I think back to a lot of things when I was a kid, which is why I really feel focused on this deal. Like we talked to you, you brought up earlier. I remember the kids that had the lunch card that had to get punched, right? And that feeling of how many punches you had at the end of 30 days, right? What that had to be like, um, you know, and that whole stigma that was behind all of that and how that works. So I can relate to that. But I know that when you plant that seed in that styrofoam cup as a kid and a little bit of dirt, and you watch that little pea, pea shoot come up. That was a big day, man. I was like, you know, it was, it was really important. And I do recall those days of doing all that. Didn't do anything with them. It's like, all right, that experiment's over back then. But I mean, it, it did set some groundwork for, I think, where we are today. So talk a little bit about school gardens and their, their value and the importance. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's, it's important to realize that schools are coming all different shapes and sizes. And so school gardens can be as simple as putting some soil in a cup and spreading some seeds, or you might have, you know, some space for some raised beds, or maybe you're a school that has actually some land and you actually have a farm at your school, or maybe you have a school food forest, which is focusing on that whole ecosystem around food and, and creating environmental spaces. Um, but school gardens can take lots of different shapes and sizes and, you know, they're outdoor classrooms. They're places for kids to, to get out, to engage, to ex experience. Um, they are so beneficial because they can be tied to so many different types of curriculum that kids are learning in schools. Um, you know, whether it's, you know, doing science around the soil or learning about plant types or just so many ways for kids to um, learn really exciting skills that are applicable to so many different things that they might be doing in their lives. Um, you know, in some schools in Georgia, you know, they have students not only, you know, actually get their hands in the dirt and grow the food, but also turn it into a business. They're purchasing the supplies for yeah. the food, they're marketing it to their fellow students, and, you know, they're actually like counting money and selling the food to teachers. So there's so many opportunities with school gardens that just become really community spaces, spaces for the students, spaces for the teachers, but also sp spaces that parents and community can come into and engage with the school as well. So they're just incredibly powerful spaces that can be applied in so many different ways. And, and like I said, you know, different schools have different opportunities for different kinds of gardens um, that can really reflect whatever is important to that community. Uh, so it's just an incredible, valuable space. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, and, it, and it's not hard to do, whether you're doing inside the classroom, you can do it outside the classroom. It's, you know, you want to talk about STEM. Okay. Let's talk about STEM and how it applies to agriculture and what it is. And, and you know, you, you, you don't think agriculture technology is going to continue to evolve as it's done in the last five years. Just wait and see it in another five years. It's going to be nuts. Yeah. And I think it's just super, super important. But to your point, these kids get involved, these kiddos get out there and they get involved and they start to ask questions of themselves and their parents and their school and what's in it. Why can't we do this? There's schools out there now that are working on chicken coops just mm -hmm. to pull the eggs out to serve, you know, to be able to have. 
uh, and to be able to show the kids that, I mean, I, th I think it's incredibly powerful. You know, a couple chickens is all you need to make a point, right? You don't need a whole, we're not talking foster farms out here, right? We just need to get some chickens moving, right? I mean, but it all makes sense. But, you know, education is a big part of this. We got to come to you on this, you know, from your perspective, especially coming out of your, your background, yeah. right? Um, because you didn't, you, be honest, I mean, I don't think you had a big, uh, you know, early on, it probably wasn't a lot of education around opening up a can of peaches and slapping it on the tray type of mentality until you started to recognize the changes that need to be made. So talk about how education, you know, all through the system is how important that is. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, it was, uh, you know, uh, when you truly see, when you you think, like I said, when I came out to California, when you you think that a, that a system is in place and you realize that it, that that food system isn't the food system that that you had built in your in your mind, you know. So for in terms of you know everybody's eating healthy foods, everybody's healthy physically, uh, they're happy, uh, all the things that come with with it. And you, and I, for me, it was that I experienced that I that personally that I wasn't seeing that in my in this community in, Cal, in California. So I knew I knew at that moment that something was wrong, uh, and it wasn't just about. Initially, it was re-educating, learning about the food system. I I had to re-educate myself. I, I I can't tell how many books I read, but I, I read a ton of books, uh, and I, and I'm, I got to meet a lot of those authors over the years as well, like Michael Pollan sure. and, and Alice Waters, and the, you know some of these people that were just uh, in this in the food movement and have known for decades. Um, but, the, but what I rec what I recognized early on was that um, this is when I say early on, 20 years ago, when I moved out to California, is that in order to be successful, that we need we needed to engage everybody. We needed to engage our students. We needed to engage our parents. We needed to engage our teachers because what I learned and what you know, what we all know, is that we've had a couple of decades that have gone by uh, where. Uh, Teachers, parents, anybody for that matter, you know they they weren't cooking much. <laughs> there wasn't a lot of attention on on the types of foods that they were serving. You know, they we're going out and buying either fast foods or you're going out and buying uh, food at a, at, a, at a grocery store that's already uh, semi prepared and uh, and weren't paying attention to how that where that food how that food is being grown, who's growing that food, and, and those kinds of things. And so yeah. I didn't go back to square one. This is really what we started doing going back to square one and making sure that we're engaging everybody along the process, that education process that you're talking about, um, including, and not limited to, but including culinary education classes during the school day. It took me 10 yeah. years to implement culinary education classes, which seemed, seemed to me like a really simple concept, but it took me 10 years in that one district to get everybody convinced that this is what we needed to do. And once we did that, then that opened the, that opened up a door of uh, many doors for that matter, but got the entire community pretty excited. And you were talking about it earlier, and I was just thinking about this when uh, when uh, we, we were when when you were saying it. But I'd have parents call me up, or or they or teachers would tell would tell me that parents were saying, "What are you doing in schools?" Because uh, my child isn't coming home hungry any longer, or right. or what's going on in school? I've got my, my child's asking me to buy kale or is asking me to buy spinach or is now eating tomatoes when they, you know, my husband and I are both, for example, here's the story. My husband and I are both chefs and we haven't been able to get our own kids to eat tomatoes. But when you do it in a, in a community setting, Todd, when you get engaged, yeah. everybody, uh, then it becomes part of the culture and that's when you start shifting that needle, if you will, and start making a difference. And that's why the education piece is so important. Uh, and so for someone that me has been around for as long as I have, I can see that 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 doors opening, they're opening slowly. We've got uh, states like California, states like Maine and, and Colorado and New Mexico and many others that are now also starting to see the importance of of, and we're going to talk a, lot, a little bit about it here in uh, values added uh, universal meals. Uh, and yeah. so that's an important piece, but uh, to this whole uh, process, but education around food to people that have never been uh, 
ex exposed to it is is so important. And I could tell, go on and just tell you story after story, but I know we got a limited amount of time. <laughs> no, but it, it but it's it's so true because it's it's you know it it is it is reinforcing something that they want to learn. It's reinforcing what they want to believe in. It's reinforcing all this other work. And if you don't support it, and I, and I think your approach between procurement, school gardens, you know, actually hands-on, let's go ahead and get a little like dirt on their hand. It's not going to kill them. A little dirt's never going to kill anybody in your hands. And then you throw in the education piece. I think it's a powerful trifecta of coming full circle with the process of making such, uh, about making change because you're support, each one's supporting each other. And we talked a little bit about this. You know, we talked about, you mentioned a little bit of how the farmers are prospering. It's something that I've heard over and over again that farmers didn't realize they could work with schools. They didn't realize the opportunities that they had. And it's there, it's there and it's available to them and they, they need to be leaning. It's like, well, where is that food coming from? Why is something being grown here when I could just get it to them down the street, right? We can figure that out. But one of the things that I think goes, you know, what you all are doing that I think is incredibly impactful, and, and, and Jessica, I'm going to throw this over to you, is, is how the communities are winning in all this and what a difference it's making. Because let's be real, we're, we've, we've talked fruits and vegetables, but we, we didn't mention cheeses, we didn't mention breads, we didn't mention, uh, you know, proteins, we didn't mention, you know, a, a host of other things that are a part of a community-based type system and a community that lives in. And, and and when I think about people in this country, we don't often understand and value our food. I bet you if you pulled 10 people in your neighborhood, they couldn't tell you what grows. You know, they probably couldn't give you five farm names within 100 miles of where you live if you had agriculture around you. Right? I mean, it's just kind of a trip. So, Jessica, I'm going to throw it to you. Talk to me about how communities are winning in all this and why that matters so much. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, Farm to school programs, you know, to Miguel's point, it's it's not just something that happens at school. It, it's about developing relationships. It's about connecting with community. It's about making sure that the community is directly benefiting from what is happening at the school. The school is the, is one of the centers in communities. And so it's, it's a place where people convene. It's a place where people come together. Um, and it's a place that really has a significant amount of power to have an impact, you know, on families. Like, to what Miguel was speaking about in terms of improving eating, but also, you know, just putting dollars back into communities. One of the benefits of farm to school is that it puts money back into the communities, whether that's jobs within the school, whether that is to producers. Um, so it's about, you know, to the, what we were talking about earlier with the um, processed food, you know, if you're purchasing processed food with your school dollars, that money is not most likely staying in your community. But if you're purchasing food directly from somebody who's located, you know, somewhere in the general vicinity of you, and you have staff in your kitchen that are prepping food from scratch, you know, and they're being paid for that versus putting something in the microwave and putting it on a tray. Um, there's just such a tremendous impact. And I think ultimately those relationships is really the biggest win because it makes communities really resilient places. We just... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm went through COVID-19 and what we saw is that school, that communities that had really strong relationships did all right. Mm -hmm. Communities that didn't have a relationship with schools and didn't have, um, you know, just strong relationships in place, they they really struggled to make sure that kids were still yeah. fed during the pandemic. So um, it's, it, it can be the most, um, difficult impact to see and yet it's really the biggest impact in my mind because it, it it's it's not just we made sure we that that kid was fed it's not just that that person who is serving your children food has a, a good paying job it is all of that combined um yeah some, such a tremendous opportunity well i think it goes back to what i think we all three agree that you know involvement parent involvement in school comes in many shapes and sizes and many different you know from 7.30 in the morning until four in the afternoon, that involvement doesn't waver. It may change what it looks like, but that involvement still needs to be there. And I think when you start to your point, you start to get your community that may not have children in school, but people that are producing something that now are involved and now have a feeling of like, I can be a part of something that maybe I'm, you know, I'm not a parent and that's okay, but I can be a part of something and making a change and, and changing for the better. Because again, and I'll say it, over and over and over and over. This is the fastest way we change our country in so many ways is by working with these kids in so many ways, whether it's helping them learn better, eat better, whatever it might be. But if we really want to take it serious, if we really want to get off the fence of just talking about stuff 
this is how we're going to make massive, massive impacts to our planet. It really is. Globally, too. Let's be honest. Globally as well. Yeah. But in this country, it's incredibly powerful. One of the things that um, you, you guys do and that you're, that you're all about is your October event that you have coming up, which is National Farm to School Month, right? And I love it. It's a, I love the fact that it's a month, right? It should just be a year. I'm just going to say that anyways out loud, <laughs> whatever, it doesn't matter. But would you please tell me a little bit about, A, what it is, you know, what's it all about? And then, but more importantly, let's make sure we don't leave off the table how people can get involved, because this is what we need. Is we're, let's throw that call to action out for folks when yeah. they're going, yeah, they're right. How do we get more involved? So who wants it? Go. Fist fight. Go. Yeah, I can Take get us started. Go, Jessica. Um, <laughs> Go. Um, you know, National Farm to School Network advocated for um, Farm to School Month in 2010 with Congress. So it's something that we started. And, you know, when we first uh, advocated for it, it was definitely about awareness building, which is still true today. It's just uh, making sure people are aware that, you know, Farm to school is out there. It's a thing. It can benefit you. It's an opportunity for schools who've never done farm to school at all to try it for the first time. And it's a really fun time of year to do that and put some initial programming together. A lot of schools will, you know, do something like uh, source 100% local. Every single thing they are serving in the school is local wow. a week during the month. Just really exciting it's an opportunity to innovate and do some really exciting things. Um, try it for the first time, scale up what you're doing. If you've already got a few things going, take it to the next level. Mm -hmm. And then just making sure, you know, parents and the community are aware it's happening, getting them involved, getting them to the campus to, to um, participate in the garden and see what's going on. Um, so it's a tremendous opportunity really just um, to celebrate, you know, people in our communities, our farmers, our producers, um, to, you know, sh for the school to showcase the incredible work that yeah. they do. They don't often have the chance to showcase, truthfully. Um, you know, so many really incredible things happen all across the nation and a lot of people don't know about them. So just to, to get those stories out there, to make sure that people are aware, um, to inspire, you know, like uh, one of the things National Farm to School Network does is, um, you know, if, if our partners are doing a specific state campaign, you know, we're helping them share that with other states, you know, and those states are then developing campaigns. So really just um, spreading and collaborating. I think uh, there's a lot of great ways to get involved. Um, a, if you're not already a member of the National Farmer School Network, go on our website and sign up for a newsletter. So you'll get all the information and resources about National Farm to School Month. Um, we put out toolkits for National Farm to School Month. So if you are a school or somebody that's supporting farm to school programming, we provide you um, a communications toolkit that helps you to be able to engage in farm to school month. Um, if you're a parent, you can go to your local school and ask them, you know, are you all doing anything for farm to school month? And if not, I'd love to help support you do something. Can we put something together? Um, and then many states do run state specific campaigns. Uh, so it's really fun to get involved in your state's campaign if they're running one. And Todd, well, membership is open. Go. Membership is open to everybody. I'd like to say, if you eat food, you should be aware of where that food's coming from. And you should, one of the best places that you can learn about uh, more about this is the National Farm to School Network that puts out a, a weekly newsletter. So anybody, it could be anybody, it could be a student, a parent, a teacher, an administrator, a community member, um, to truly anyone. It, uh, uh, there's no cost to membership. Uh, and mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's, again, it's lots, there's lots of benefits, uh, and it truly allows you to be engaged, uh, as Jessica was saying, with your extended community, uh, or your posting community in terms of what's going on. Um, and so, um, anyway, I just want to stress that point, because sometimes people think, well, it's just, oh, this is, this is a school, national farm to school, so it must be a, a school member, you know, it's only school right. employees. No, this is the your the entire community. Look, if you're in a community that's to the point, you're you're baking bread, you're you're you've got a yeah. cheese shop, you're doing whatever it might be that you're doing, get involved because these are your next customers. And why not get your kids? You know, why not work with these kiddos to understand what local means? What understand yeah. what food miles mean? What carbon for all these other things we want to talk about? What a great way to educate them, and what a great way for people in the community to get involved back with the schools in a way that's incredibly uplifting right there's no i, I have a, a buddy of mine i just had lunch with he's talking about he's volunteering at edible garden 
you know, a day or two a month, whatever it is, because he's enjoying being out there and he's enjoying mm-hmm. being around the kids. And he's got a hell of a lot of agriculture knowledge to pass on. Mm-hmm. Get involved with some of this stuff. It's so yeah. incredibly important. It really, really is. I, I can't stress it enough that the opportunities that are out there and I just don't see the school saying no. I don't think they're going to say, no, what do you mean? You want to come help us learn how to plant, you know, or <laughs> dig a hole or whatever it might be. Donate, you know, wood to make a raised bed. Yeah. I don't, you know. We got to yeah. get past all that. We got to get, you know, get involved and be a part of it. Absolutely. You know, as, as we're, as you know, we're sitting here, one of the programs you have is bringing the farm uh, to school program, which I think is kind of self-explanatory in a lot of ways. I know we've covered quite a lot. We've gone through it, but I want to reemphasize, and I'll let you run with this, Jessica, I'm going to go to you with this one really quick, but I want to reemphasize back to the farming community and the agriculture people, and the people that listen to this broadcast all over the world now, mm-hmm. um, that you can make a difference as a massive apple grower or a, well, whomever you might be, there's a way that you can help and you can do things not only in your own community, but on, on a larger scale and to be a part of it. it needs to really be a part of, I think your thought process as a producer, it's like, how am I working for the next customer? How hard am I working to educate these kids on, you know, a fresh apple is pretty damn good, right? How do we do that? So can you touch on it really quick? I think we might've covered if I didn't, Jessica, just, I want to make sure we get at least a shout out or something. If you wouldn't mind talking about bringing the farm to school program real quick. Yeah, absolutely. So bringing the farm to school is a program that we co-developed with NCAT. And um, it's really about the farmer producer side of farm to school. Um, The intent is to help farmers and producers get ready to sell to schools and then open up that market to them. So whether that's through direct sales or, you know, linking them up to schools through a food hub or a distribution site, um, it's really about making sure that um, farmers and producers are benefiting from school purchasing power. And, you know, it's, it's not easy. There's no infrastructure in place to sell to schools. You know, farmers have a product, you know, perhaps it needs to be packaged a certain way. Perhaps it needs to be delivered. There's so many components and and it's um, truly, you know, there's no one size fits all solution. So, so this program is, is um, rolled out nationwide. We provide training to producers to help assess their readiness, help them get ready. If there's things that maybe aren't a good fit for them, helping them understand what it means to sell to schools, what schools need, what they're looking for and how they can, um, you know, think about what they're growing or what they're producing. um, That's going to align with what a school needs. Uh, You know, if we can bring more small and and local mid-sized farmers reliable, consistent income through schools, it's a really big win for those producers having that market. And there's so many opportunities for value add. For example, you know, if we're if if a taste test is happening at a school and kids are all tasting something for the first time, it is not uncommon for that particular item to sell out at the local grocery store. And so right. not only then you're selling to schools, but then you have an opportunity to be introduced to local markets and, and add additional markets. Um, yeah. So the project is really about helping farmers benefit from this programming and making sure that we're bringing them along and we're not just selling or we're not just providing like healthy food in schools, but the food that we're providing is providing that direct benefit within that immediate community. Yeah, thank you. And I, I, I wanted that shout out to get out because I think it's important to grow community, recognize that there are toolkits out there. There are people that have already walked the walk that can open up some doors and create some, at least conversation inside your own companies. Like, can we do this? How do we do this? How does it fit? Let's, you know, and more importantly, hopefully get to the point, like, let's make this fit into our business model. Because again, I think it's the fastest way we change this world is by working hard with these kiddos without a doubt. I'm going to throw a big one at you guys as we kind of wind our time down a little bit, you know, and I I got to go back to this, but there's as many as 16 million kids in this country that are hungry every day. Mm -hmm. That number crushes my heart every time I think about it. But since March of 2020, that number has gotten worse in this country. Mm -hmm. There's a rapid rise in food insecurity. It is real. So my question to you, wave your magic wand. Tell me how to fix this problem. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Uh, I'll start. I'll start by that uh, because I've, that magic wand, as you say, we've been waving it for a long time. And I think that uh, it, a, a little bit of, uh, of these, uh, whatever, whatever's on that wand is starting to take place. And we're, I'm talking about universal meals. Uh, we finally, as I said earlier, we've got uh, states that are uh, passing um, 
some legislation that's allowing for universal meals for uh, allowing us to provide uh, meals to all students, regardless of, of economic status of those students. So uh, it, it helps the students in, in many, many ways um, from, from a social justice point of view, because it really engages all students in the, in the cafeteria. But uh, in addition to universal meals, uh, Todd, I want to say that one of the things that I didn't think about it in, the, in these terms back when I was uh, when we were promoting universal meals and talking about, I mean, for decades, we've been asking for universal meals uh, for students because we know the benefits that it has for, for everyone. Uh, but when you take universal meals and you, and you combine it with values aligned universal meals. So for example, why are we even going down this road uh, of providing universal, universal meals? Because A, it addresses health injustices, to make, making sure that all students are, are being uh, served the healthiest foods possible. It addresses economic injustices. It addresses environmental injustices, if you will, uh, and addresses animal welfare uh, issues that we're all con concerned with as well. Um, employees' rights, uh, being able to have the, 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 the uh, number of employees that you, you need for uh, your, for the labor that you're providing. So uh, when you take uh, universal meals and you combine it with uh, values, added value, these added values, you know, it, everybody benefits uh, in that community from, from uh, being able to do uh, what's best um, for students, for, uh, for parents, for, for uh, the teachers in those schools, and, uh, and of course, for the extended community as, as well. Uh, so, um, you know, I, I'd like to see us as a country uh, implement universal uh, uh, meals, value added, you know, aligned universal meals uh, throughout the yeah. country, and then uh, focus on the things that are truly important. Yeah, Jessica, over to you, wave that magic wand. My answer is the same. If we can make sure every single kid has access to food in schools without having to pay for it, without the stigma of signing up for free and reduced for, for those that may need to do that. Um, it's just an incredibly powerful thing. You know, we should be feeding people. Food is, food is not a privilege. It's a right. So, you know, there's no better way to make sure that all kids are fed. And then while we're feeding kids, we're changing the way that we do that through that values lines piece that Miguel was talking about. Yeah. We're making yeah. sure that food is healthy, that it has a health impact, that we're not just feeding kids for free, but they're getting nachos and pizza and prepackaged cookies or something like that, that we are, you know, using sustainable farming practices that we're help those school dollars go towards that kind of transformation. So it's, you know, it's, it's a huge need. And at this, and if we're doing it, we can, hit so many different things that are important and touching this process and related to it and impact people's lives. You know, going back to what I was saying at the beginning, you know, it's not just about feeding kids in the moment. It's about changing the reasons the kids need to be fed in the first place. And that really is values on universal meals for me. I think that has tremendous impact um, for where we are right now currently. And it's, it's something that's happening in, in some states which is really exciting. But if we can roll this out nationally, it's incredibly powerful and something that uh, National Farmer School Network is currently working on. Yeah, no, I think it's incredibly powerful. And I think it comes down to one thing. We need to do a better job of spending our taxpayer dollars on things that are going to make actual differences. And our kiddos is that. And I think mm -hmm. we've got to start leaning into that. We've got to start questioning some of this a little bit harder and asking, why does it matter when this doesn't seem to matter? Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's powerful. And I think we need to start leaning into that. You two are amazing. I got to tell you, you're absolutely amazing. I got, is there anything exciting coming up? Anything that I didn't cover? I mean, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm, I'm I just, you know, I'm exhausted from this conversation because I love it so much. <laughs> and it's so freaking important to have, yeah. you know, obviously I get a little bit wrapped into this because I believe so much that we have this power to make so many changes and it just, it's right there for the taking. And we just go, where is it? I can't see it. And it yeah. just pisses me off to no end. What's yeah. new and exciting coming up? Anything? Uh, no? Somebody. 
Well, well <laughs> you're coming back. We got. We need to come back in October and kick off the month. I want to do that. Yeah. That's just going to happen for sure. Yeah. Let's chat that up. Is there, what's new? Is there some big announcement? I mean, I don't you know, know, you know I, great. For, for me, really quick, uh, Todd. Um, you know, uh, I came on board uh, because I, I, you know, just seen what had happened as a school food service director, and I knew that an organization that the National Farmer School Network is, is making a huge difference. And so what's when you say what's new and important, it's it's these relationships that we're building, these these uh, you know, there's people yeah. out there, there's organizations out there, there's there's establishments out there that that they don't know that there, there are organizations like the National Farmer School Network that are working on their behalf, even in communities, are you know, they they're just not aware. So when you say what's new is that is those uh, making people aware uh, through uh, venues like this one that you you provided for us, um, and um, and many others for that matter, uh, but just making them aware about what 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 we're doing and how they can be engaged in the process. Because together, working together, we're definitely going to make a difference. We've made a difference to this to this point, but we need to continue to um, you know work work together to I, I, again. Um, continue to, to um, make a difference in the, in the lives of these uh, the, of our children, uh, making sure that they're they're being um, addressed in the best possible way. So for me, it's exciting, these new relationships. Uh, I said when I left as a food service director that I needed to find a, an organization that I could, I had a megaphone and I could speak from a megaphone to a larger audience. I found it with this organization, and that's what that's what I've been able to do. And, I've, and I'm 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 uh, uh, excited about some of these new partnerships that are that are forming. Todd, honestly, around the I love country. It. yeah, I love it. I'm excited for you guys. Jessica, anything to throw on top of it? Yeah, you know, honestly, what is new and exciting is the fact that there is so much opportunity right now in this moment to really impact some of these things. So, you know, COVID showed us that we can give all kids free meals, right? We just need to push that forward now that those waivers yeah. have been. Um, You know, right now, USDA is taking comments on the, the child nutrition operator guidelines. So for serving food, and one of the things that's really exciting that NFSN has been advocating for for over 10 years is the ability for schools to specify local in their procurement contracts. So mm -hmm. it will remove an immense amount of barriers uh, to actually being able to put dollars in directly into farmer and producers' hands. Um, it makes it so much easier, it, you know, and we're just incredibly excited about the fact that that is being included and added moving forward. Mm -hmm. I just, uh, there is so much happening right now in this moment so being mm -hmm. poised to just stand and, and and advocate for farm to school and move it forward is what i'm most excited about i love it that's a great place to wrap up our time <laughs> thank you both thank you both for what you do thank yeah. you thank yeah. you again todd for giving us this opportunity to uh talk a little bit about what the national farm to school network brings to the table and and talk about who's at the table and who, who should be at the table um, so we, Jessica and I truly appreciate your, your time, um, and, uh, continue to do that good work and get the, we've got those, as you, as I see behind you, those lunch time heroes, it's, uh, you're exactly right. The people that are out there, uh, working in the schools, doing this work day in and day out, they truly are the heart and soul of this work without them. Uh, we wouldn't be able to do the things that we do. So I appreciate I agree you with that. supporting supporting them well thank you I, I i will continue to i will continue to advocate and continue to fight because i really truly believe this is the one of the ways we can heal our country and help our country in so many different ways and uh you know we just got to keep pushing so people get involved thank you both for being here much love from my team to your team uh open invitation come back let's talk in october about what's going on for the month get people fired up and excited you know and and keep this conversation rolling because it's so incredibly powerful so thank you both for being here thank you todd Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks, everybody, for watching and hanging out with us today. I truly appreciate you. I hope you got inspired by this. If this didn't inspire you, 
call me. I don't know what to give you. Maybe it's a Mountain Dew. I don't want to even do that, but something. <laughs> but find some inspiration out of this because there's a lot to be excited about. This is the way we need to go, kiddos. We need to go out and help our young people today get their minds opened up to food and agriculture. What's going on? Let's change the planet. We can do it. We can do it locally in our communities. It's not hard to do. Just go get involved. Thank you for being here. Please make sure you check us out on social media, TLC underscore conversation. I hang out on social media just because people like this are there and I want to like what they're doing and love them up all I can from all angles. And you should be doing the same thing. So thanks for being here. Take care of everybody. We'll talk at you soon. Adios. Adios.